Pati Raghava Raja Ram, Pati Tapa Bana Sita Ram. I'm not going, I'm not going to. No, it's not torture. We love it. I'm sure you would. <laughs> but thank you. No, I do need that. Oh, need yeah, that. I need okay. that. Sure, I definitely. Um, but I definitely want to say that I would not have missed a word of your magnificent service this morning. It reminds me of the moment when Sharon and I, Sharon, my wife of 63 years, who has accompanied me. Honey, will you stand up and wave, and maybe you can fix you, you can sing the rest of Raghu Pati. <laughs> <laughs> so we met in the villages of Nepal when we were exchange students before the Peace Corps began. And uh, it was instant love on my part, not insurance. <laughs> and, I knew I had found my soulmate. Thank you for these 63 years of suffering <laughs> and torment. <laughs> yes. Well, it's not generally known uh, that Gandhiji, we call him Gandhiji because it's a special honorific term, uh, and I blessed by a close knowledge of the Hebrew Bible as well as the New Testament. And uh, one of our favorite verses, uh, turn to page 739, not necessarily now, but later, okay, <laughs> in Leviticus. If a man loses the hair of his head and becomes bald, he is pure. <laughs> <laughs> now you you missed you missed that one, uh, but, but Gandhiji and I definitely didn't. Thank you for doing that. Does Sharon Klambaum miss any need, any wish? It's a wonder that she's my soulmate. I found her understatement last night of the moment that Sharon and I knew each other, she didn't know me well, but I knew her well, uh, was she had just turned 18. And uh, you remember last night, the biggest laugh in the well, whole event was when she told the story of having been involved in the immense 1,500 students protest against apartheid in South Africa. That is Columbia's investment in apartheid in South Africa. Well, I was in my office and uh, a couple of big guys from Columbia came in and said to me, Professor Dalton, you've got to see this. <laughs> this is just amazing. There is a little freshman from Barnard <laughs> who is leading this 1,500 student protest. And I said, first, there's no way you would get 1,500 students together because this is impossible today, you know. We, we don't have gatherings that large. My grandson is a first year at Columbia right now, and he assures me uh, that if there are 1,500 students, they're fighting with one another, unfortunately, and that's not a joke. But at this particular occasion, we were united, as I said last night, Sharon, we were all singing as one free Nelson Mandela, and we knew we were on the right side of history. Well, I went over in the midst of preparing my lecture because I had to see this wonder. After all, it was a Barnard <laughs> freshman, and Colombian and Barnard aren't always in the best terms because apologies to Barnardians here, but we were inferior. And uh, second, it was a woman, and then third, it was a freshman. <laughs> Well, 
I got there, and here was this little kid standing in the midst of this huge crowd, and she brought us together. I couldn't believe it. I looked at her first and wasn't impressed, and then she, she opened her mouth. Now you've become a grant. You've come to take for granted, right, for uh, what you have here. I didn't take that for granted initially, but I sure do now. I'm just so impressed with the way in which she speaks, with this boundless eloquence, as she just overflows with it constantly whenever I hear her. It's absolutely amazing. And you, I need not tell you, are so incredibly fortunate to have had this. Sharon, uh, yes, yes, Sharon, my wife, and I were at the, <laughs> at the, <laughs> at the inauguration, and uh, we didn't get up to receive our hugs uh, because our old bones are just not allowing us easily to get, but nevertheless, we would have, I think that was a high point, wasn't it, in our lives, when we saw my star stellar student receive that honor here. Sharon, how can I express my love for you? I'm not going to get into tears again because I, I didn't write this all out this time because I didn't trust myself last night. Let's let's not let's not get into that. The uh, <laughs> the point is that we're talking about Gandhi, and uh, to make it as brief as possible, I'm going to talk about three precise moments in his life. Not years or decades, not even weeks or months, but moments, exact hours of his life, which we must remember as utter moments of truth. This represents what, when it all came together for him at these three successive times. Think first, though, in terms of the context. What this single person was facing, the British Empire, beginning and thank you, Sharon. Is, is there anything else that Sharon does? <laughs> Sharon, why don't you just read this? <laughs> It would sound much, much better than my droning on. At any rate, okay. Never before in the history of the world had so few controlled so many from so far for so long with so little technological support. I hope you appreciate all of those so, so, so. It took me 30 years to keep adding those so, so, so. Uh, at any rate, this was phenomenal. This was an empire. 60 million people in this little island at most, controlling, governing directly somehow, this vast part of the world stemming through the Middle East, down to South Africa, across to the jewel and the crown that is India, and then beyond that to Malaysia, on to Hong Kong, as Churchill said, the sun will never set on the British Empire. It was literally true. And that's not even mentioning the Commonwealth countries today, Canada, New Zealand, etc. Magnificent. And this is what Gandhi faced at this time. He was born October 2nd, 1969. Why do I do that? 1869. 
I keep making myself younger. Anyway, the point is that I just, 1869, same year as Emma Goldman, our blessed Emma Goldman, and Gandhi was born in what we might say a backwater of a backwater. Uh, that is, Britain controlled India through no fewer than 562 princely provinces. That is, Maharajas, who would pay their obeisance to the British Empire, in addition to the hundreds of millions of Indians who were not part of those princely kingdoms. Gandhi was part of that princely kingdom in Gujarat, and not known at all by anyone. So I usually, as I lecture on Gandhi, I give, and I'm now burdening you with them, 10 good reasons why Gandhi couldn't have been a leader of India. One, that he was in a backwater of a backwater, this little tiny locality that no one had heard of. The Indian National Congress, the protest movement, began in 1885. Gandhi didn't join as a leader of the protest movement until 1919. He spent 21 years in South Africa. So first of all, he couldn't have become a leader because the leaders of the Indian National Congress from 1885 until 1919 were all from the big cities from Bombay and Calcutta and Madras and Delhi. Who was Gandhi? No one. And then he came from the wrong caste. The rest of the leaders were from the Brahmin caste. Gandhi was from the Vaishya caste, that is the third down. And uh, they were despised. Gandhi's caste was known as the Vaishya or grocers and they were despised by the upper caste, by the Brahmins. So a Banya to come in as leader of the Indian National Congress, unthinkable. Gandhi then, backwater of a backwater and a low caste, what was he? He had been in South Africa for 21 years before he came onto the Indian scene. How could this be? He turned each of these disadvantages into an advantage. First of all, he was a person of the people. He was from the peasantry. He was low down in the caste ladder as most Indians were. He wasn't a Brahmin, he wasn't from the elite. And that became for him magical. Second of all, he was grosser, <laughs> unthinkable. And then a person who had spent 21 years in South Africa and suddenly coming on the scene, but while he was in South Africa, he discovered civil disobedience. Civil disobedience, that's a glorious term, isn't it? But what it amounts to is not anything glorious and sound, not peace, not even nonviolence. But one word that I want you to remember, and that is non cooperation. That's what he learned in South Africa. We must refuse our obedience to this British crown. We must not comply. Sounds easy. For the first part of his time in South Africa, he was a lawyer. And then I said, the moment in his life came, the first. It was in 1906. And we can pin it down to 8 p.m., September 11th, 1906. 
because he tells us in his autobiography that's when it was. And what happened? The Indians had been humiliated by something called registration, when the Indians called it the Black Act. And the registration was that all people of color had to be registered by the British, by the British white police, with women sometimes stripped so that they could be identified in terms of birthmarks or whatever. And they stripped them and they humiliated them. And Gandhi called this meeting. And the meeting was only to be of a very few people, maybe a number of people in this room now. And suddenly 3,000 Indians turned up. He was aghast. And there he was at about 3 o'clock in the afternoon on this uh, platform, thinking furiously, what am I to say? I've practiced law all this time. And it was a very lucrative law career that he had. And the speakers went on and on telling people how they may sign petitions in order to mark their defiance and all that sort of thing. And Gandhi had no idea of what he was about to say. He tells us his mind was just in a muddle. He had to say something that was new and different. And then suddenly, Around quarter of eight that, after, that evening, a Muslim merchant whose wife had been humiliated by the examination that she was put through by a British white officer, Hajib Mujib, who has heard of Hajib Mujib now, but he stood up in the back of the room, this large auditorium, and he said, by God, I will go to prison before I obey this law. And Gandhi hadn't thought of it. He hadn't thought as a lawyer of going to prison for a long time, a very long time as it turned out, in order to resist. That was the essence of non-cooperation. It wasn't at that time, he hadn't read Thoreau, and it wasn't at that time anything like civil disobedience that we glorify today in one way or another. It was simply going to prison, and Gandhiji gave a speech then, 1,300 words, and in that speech, the word vow is repeated numerable times, 42 times, and he said, this is a sacred moment. We are taking a vow now. And the vow will be that we will not comply. We will no longer accept this kind of humiliation. The crowd was electrified. But he went on and on, and in the course of that speech, he used the word suffering and self-sacrifice over and again. And he said, remember, if we go to jail, our property will be confiscated. And it was. We will lose our wealth. And they did. We will be tortured in prison. And they were. And we will take this vow and we will not break it. And they did. It was an amazing moment. That's when civil disobedience was born. That's when we talk about peace and all the rest. It was born with suffering, with immense self-sacrifice. That's how it came about. That's the first moment. The second moment, November 13th, 1909. He had been practicing 
civil disobedience during this time from 1906 to 1909, in prison most of the time, tortured, beaten by the police, and urging others to be tortured and beaten. And he decided he had to face up to the real threat that civil disobedience faced. And that was not from the British primarily, but from the terrorists. People don't realize now when they study terrorism that terrorism wasn't born yesterday. Terrorism was alive and well in India and especially in Britain when Indian terrorists would kill British officials ruthlessly. Sir Curzon Wiley, nobody's heard of Sir Curzon Wiley now, but he was murdered on the steps of his house in front of his wife and children just before Gandhi arrived in London. Why? To debate with the terrorists. And so he engaged in this debate day and night, and the debate was over this issue. Is violence or nonviolence going to liberate India? Well, the terrorists had no doubt that it would be violence. And as a matter of fact, quite coincidentally, there was a guy by the name of B.S. Savarkar who was debating with him. Now, Savarkar was the teacher of Nataram Godsa, who assassinated Gandhi in January 30th, um, 19, it's really escaped me, thank you, 48. Uh, he was, he was there, thank you. He was there. And in the film, I think it's a magnificent Attenborough film. And uh, he, Attenborough, thank you, thank you, okay, that's all right. As long as I don't keep slipping. Yeah, thank you. Isn't she wonderful? I'm doing great. <laughs> If I were hubristic enough to believe all of these compliments that I've received. Anyway, the point is <laughs> that uh, doing great. Uh, I can only say that Savarkar in the picture, Attenborough picture, he's pictured there as an old man in a cart, and he's approving of Goetze as uh, Goetze then performs the assassination. Imagine that. All these years later, from 1909 to 1948, uh, Savarkar is determined to kill Gandhi. And he did. So the terrorists, they were formidable. Amazing organization. Far better than the nonviolent civil disobedience. They had what the British feared most. And that was the capacity to throw bombs and to kill high British officials like Sir Curtis Curtis and Wiley. Extraordinary. So when we get to Gandhi in 1909, he is in a fierce debate with the terrorists. What, what is the better motive, better method? Remember the terrorists being better armed to take over by killing few British officials, as they can subsequently did. Gandhi engaged in this intense debate. And so he gets on the ship back home from London to South Africa, where he is still leading the civil disobedience protest. <clears throat> he sits in a kind of coma for 48 hours, he says and the SS Caledonian. And for those 48 hours, he's desperately trying to get his thoughts together. What can I say? And then at white heat, he writes the great document called Hind Swaraj, Indian Home Rule. I sometimes say, if you read anything at all from Gandhi, uh, it's Hind Swaraj. And I, 
I think that there's so, there so much competition in these 100 volumes of Gandhi that I won't say that anymore, but say, read something. <clears throat> and then after all that, <clears throat> read maybe the book that Sharon has acclaimed three or four or five times and <laughs> by me. Thank you, Sharon. I really appreciate that. At any rate, white heat. And the extraordinary part is if he's writing in Gujarati, if you compare the original Gujarati, <clears throat> the first part with the second part, in the middle of the book, it seems like it's written by another person. And the reason is that he is so tired writing his, with his right hand that he has to switch to his left hand. And it's just amazing. He's writing his thoughts down with such intensity. And so we can say at this very moment that he completes Hind Swaraj. Now, what is Hind Swaraj about? Well, very, very, very briefly, it's about a element that the terrorists had denied. And that is the means end relationship. It turns on this. And whenever we think about nonviolent civil disobedience, think first about this one doctrine. You reap as you sow. What goes around comes around. Crucial if we boil down his Swaraj to one phrase. It's not nonviolence, much as that's, again, a glorious term. But it's the heart of what the terrorists are denying. Marx denied this, of course, and that's the fatal flaw in Marxism, as we know, and Trotsky and the other communists whom Gandhi rejected completely. But think about this. Think hard about this. As we face war today, and that is the relationship of the means to the end. The means, Gandhi says, are sometimes dismissed as, after all, only means. Means are everything. And as one of my teachers, A.J. Musty, said, there is no way to peace. Peace is the way. That's the second moment. The third moment is the most important. You may well disagree with this third moment, what I'm about to repeat. I, I find disagreement over this frequent, especially when I talk about war now. But it is unquestionably the most important. April 13th, 1919. I got that one right. And so, here it is. Gandhi is in the midst of his civil disobedience campaign. And uh, it has, understandably, the non-cooperation aroused the British because they are aware suddenly that Gandhiji is going to bring down the crown if, if, if they don't do something because he's non-cooperating, non-cooperating all over the place with everyone. And so I got this straight from uh, the Gan Gandhi's uh, personal physician, a very close friend of mine, Sharon's and mine, for many years. And the British were confident about Gandhi being unaware of, of the, his own limitations. His personal physician was taking his blood pressure, and he did have high blood pressure, fairly high, 180 over 90. And so his wife said, after reading the reports of the British, uh, that they were confident, look, this old man, he's not going to make it. 
He can't possibly lead this campaign in his condition. And Kasturbis said, according to, as I said, uh, Sushila Nair, his personal position, she said, ah, the British have missed one point about Gandhiji. Bapu, as she called him, father. She said, Gandhiji suffers from high blood pressure only when he's cooperating with the British. <laughs> but when he is defying them, his blood pressure goes down to normal. And he couldn't be happier. And that's the point, isn't it, uh, that so many of us miss, that when we are in good health, when we're at our best, we're doing what's right. In the midst of the suffering and the torture that he was going through, he was fine. And I've heard from our friends, Daniel Berrigan and Phil Berrigan, who spent more years in jail than uh, seven years in jail between them than uh, we would. By the way, they're aware of your jail record, right? Yeah, yeah right, yeah. yeah. <laughs> we, we, everybody here aware of, uh, yeah, yeah, right? Oh, good, I'm glad. No, oh, okay, you can't, yeah, yeah. Not entirely, <laughs> okay. Well, I just might add this, that <laughs> when, <laughs> when Sharon was showing the courage that I lacked and she was in jail in Virginia as it happened, I sent a telegram to her through her mother and I said this, Gandhi would be proud. And uh, her mother said it brought her to tears. Well, fortunately, Sharon, you got out before Phil Berrigan and Daniel Berrigan. <laughs> At any rate, the point is uh, that Gandhi, we should be proud of him at this moment, but especially for this reason, because the Amritsar, city of Amritsar, 100 miles north of Delhi, was the site of a massacre. It was a massacre that compares with what Thucydides wrote. A horrendous massacre. A group of 10,000 people gathered in this square, Hindus, Muslims, Sikhs, it happened to be a Sikh holiday as well, Muslim holiday. On the afternoon, you've seen this depicted in Richard Attenborough's film, uh, on the afternoon near sunset of April 13th. They were there not for protest as it happened. They were there for a religious holiday. 10,000 people. It was the size of a football field, a large football field. And there was a well, a 100 feet deep well in the middle of it. And <clears throat> they were there celebrating uh, their various religions. And remember there were Muslims and Sikhs and Hindus there all together and all celebrating. Well, General Reginald Dyer, a name that will live in infamy, General Dyer felt that they had defied his martial order not to gather in large crowds and that they needed to be punished. So in the middle of Gandhi's protest campaign, in the middle of this religious holiday, Dyer marched 50 of his crack rifles to the square. He said after in his testimony that he would have brought in a cannon or a machine gun if he could have, but the square was too, the opening of the square was too small. If you ever go there, go to Amritsar because it's a memorial and the British royalty have tried desperately to go there themselves and to apologize, not quite apologize, but say this was a regretful event, that kind of thing. But they, uh, nevertheless, the square <clears throat> surrounded by nine foot walls <clears throat> that we couldn't get over easily and one entrance, only seven feet wide, one entrance and we, 
Sharon and I have been there and marched the kids through it and that sort of thing. Uh, and there's a magnificent museum. One entrance and these 10,000 people. General Dyer marched his troops, 50 crack rifles, most of them Indians and Nepalis who were complying with the British orders. Think about that for a moment. He wasn't using mainly British troops. He was using Indian cooperators because as Gandhi had said in 1919, this country, it was not taken by the British. We gave it to them. We cooperated. These Indians that shot Indians were cooperators. And so they marched into the square and uh, fired 1,650 rounds in 10 minutes indiscriminately into this crowd of men, women, and babies. There was such panic that mothers threw their children down this well and jumped in after them to try to get rescue from this barrage of bullets. Well, I've talked to relatives of people who were related to those who suffered. Because in addition to the 400 people, according to the British report, who were murdered by General Dyer and his troops, there were 1,700 who were, out of the 10,000, who were killed. General Dyer gave orders at this time. First order, do not attend those killed or wounded in the square. Second order, we must set an example so this will not happen again. And we were proud to do it well. We shot true. Third order, the most infamous order of all, the crawling order. And that was the order that those who managed to get out of the square, those who had in his judgment defied his martial law, which was, by the way, printed all over and posted only in English and not in other languages, his martial law to forbid and he got assemblies. It was to be punished. And how was it punished? These are the words of his report. These Indian defiance were to get down on the ground and crawl like worms to show their repentance for disobedience. Those are the words that he used utter humiliation. And these were for the people who survived or had not been in the square in the first place. Well, Gandhi got the word and he couldn't believe it. He couldn't believe the British had descended that low because after all, he was a British trained lawyer and he still had one element within him of faith in the British Empire. One iota that they couldn't possibly descend into these depths of depravity and inhumanity. It, no, it couldn't be. But then, he came forth with a statement that the whole world, including the New York Times afterwards, quoted on April 14th, 15th, 16th, <clears throat> 1919. And we all know the line, don't we? And that is, an eye for an eye, and the whole world will go blind. 
if we use the same means that General Dyer used, we become like Dyer. That's the way it works. It's the essence of revenge. We will not accept revenge. And so then he told the world and the Indians, especially the terrorists who were crying for blood at this time, he told the world that we will forgive them. Now imagine this for a moment. Please concentrate on this for a moment as we are at war, deadly war. This is what Gandhi told us in the face of this horrendous tragedy, a tragedy that struck him as a Hindu to his heart, the most heart-wrenching experience that he could possibly have. Think about it. Now, there is a consensus among British historians now, years later, and we can only wonder what British and American and other historians will say about us right now when they reflect back on what we're doing. And the consensus is this. Victim of this horrendous colonialism, of this terrible imperialism, these victims are not just the Indians. They're the British. The British have been victimized by their own dominance, by their insistence on what we call now, philosophers call the domination submission complex. They've lowered themselves. That's what we say now. The greatest historians, in retrospect, we look back then, now, on this time in 1918. And so I ask you, how will they, in the hen henceforth, how will they look back on us and what we're doing? Look within yourself, as Gandhiji said over and again, turn the searchlight inward. Ask yourself what the judgment of history will be. And I have myself, <sighs> tormented over this. I mentioned this to Sharon before when we were opposing apartheid in South Africa. We knew what the judgment of history would be. We knew that apartheid couldn't last forever in South Africa. We knew then that we were on the right side. What's the right side today? What will they say about us? Well, Gandhiji had no doubt. He said, the victims are the British. And we must strive in this pit of inhumanity to join hands with them and help each other pull us out of this degradation that we're suffering. There is no other way. That's the three moments. And so I leave you with Gandhiji's message uh, that I've been preaching for 60 years now. And uh, you can tell where I am about it. But nevertheless, the point is just this. As Martin Luther King, whom I followed as I followed Sharon, said, the, as we all know, the moral arc, history is long, but it bends towards justice. There will be justice at the end. Thank you for this.